Hi, and welcome to this lesson on gene therapy. So this is the last lesson in the syllabus for year 13 students. Um, just this one to finish, and uh, then I'm going to be setting you a little doddle task over the uh, Easter sort of holidays uh, to be doing. So uh, for this lesson, you'll need to have printed out this sheet, um, which I'm going to attach to the PowerPoint that goes with this lesson on Teams. So you could print that out or you could just draw that in your book if you don't um, sort of have a yeah, printer that works, you can draw this in your book and uh, as a place to take notes. Okay, let's go. So the first thing I want you to do is to add the key definitions for germline gene therapy and somatic cell gene therapy. Pause the video, add those definitions and come back. Okay, so germline gene therapy is defined as gene therapy by inserting functional alleles into gametes or zygotes. So germline gene therapy means that it will be um, the new genes or the new alleles that you insert into an organism will be inheritable. They will be able to be passed down from generation to generation. Somatic cell gene therapy is gene therapy by inserting functional alleles into body cells. So, for example, into lung cells um, and they would not, those genes, those functioning alleles would not be able to be inherited down the generations. So here's a question for you to follow up on those two definitions. One of these is being trialed and the other is banned. Why do you think that is? Have a think, pause the video, I'll come back in a sec. Okay, so, well, hopefully you kind of had a guess and thought that maybe it was the somatic cell therapy that is being trialed. You're right, it is. Germline therapy is currently banned just because there's risks. Well, I mean, there's risks to both therapies, but the thing about germline therapy is if you um, kind of uh, create some sort of damage in the DNA or some sort of problem in the DNA, you could potentially be affecting future generations, um, which we do not want to take the risk of, uh, potentially harming every generation that comes after a person has, uh, has had some, some uh, germline therapy. Okay, let's move on and look at the gene therapy types. Okay, so let's look at those germline somatic cell therapies in a uh, bit more detail. So germline therapies um, involve altering either the sperm or the egg cell, um, or I suppose if you altered the very early embryo, that could also uh, produce an inheritable change. So DNA in the, in the nucleus of the sperm or egg is changed. Somatic cell therapy um, uses a vector to introduce new functioning alleles into cells that need it. For example, we're going to look at cystic fibrosis in a, in a minute here, um, and we can use different types of vectors to try and get the genes into these um, goblet cells that produce the mucus in the lungs. Okay, so that's somatic versus germline uh, therapy. So before we get into these different ways in which we can uh, treat potentially cystic fibrosis, I would like you to look at uh, this video to recap on what is cystic fibrosis, the biochemistry of it. Okay, it's only two, three, two minutes and a half long. Um, the link is on the PowerPoint where you can search for this, cystic fibrosis mechanism and treatment, uh, and it has really good molecular animations of the actual mutant protein, the CFTR gene, and how it doesn't work so well uh, when there is this mutation. So watch this video, um, this one here, pause it, and then come back to me when you're done. Okay, off you go. Okay, so hopefully you got from this that cystic fibrosis is an inherited genetic disease and it's caused by uh, an inheritance of two recessive alleles uh, and the, the mutation is in the CFTR gene. So this is a chloride ion transport protein and, and what it causes um, is when those chloride are, in a normal patient, when the chlorine ions move out of the cell, water follows by osmosis. And this causes the mucus to be more watery and, and, and sort of uh, less, less viscous. Now, if you can't push out these um, chlorine ions through the CFTR protein, water also doesn't flow. So therefore, the mucus is thicker. So this thick mucus in cystic fibrosis, uh, cystic fibrosis patient builds up, causing inflammation, causes repeated lung infections. Eventually, it can lead to scarring of the lung tissue uh, and eventually... Uh, death. So 
there have been great strides made in treatment of cystic fibrosis. Um, several years ago when I started teaching this, I think the life expectancy for a cystic fibrosis patient was sort of in the early 30s, and I think now it's a bit longer with new drugs like the one you saw in the video. But we're looking to be able to treat it with gene therapy. So how would that work? Well, gene therapy involves altering the genotype of the organism. So there's two basic strategies. Number one, replace the defective gene with a normal allele. So in this image here, here's a defective gene and we just kind of remove it and replace it with the functioning allele for the CFDR protein. Or we could supplement. So we could kind of, if we can't quite figure out how to cut out this one, we can just add in the new, um, the functioning allele. And because, you know, they, this is a recessive gene and this is a dominant gene, then the dominant gene would be able to mask the effects of it. So that would only be um, uh, work, uh, workable with a recessive genetic condition. So you, that wouldn't, for example, work with uh, Huntington's disease, which is a dominant genetic condition. So the main thing that you need to understand is about the different vectors that we can use to get um, genes into target cells. So for example, uh, in cystic fibrosis therapy, people have tried liposome vectors and modified viral vectors. So this is where we're going to look at these in a bit more detail and you're going to fill out your notes in this format. So describe the vector, give an example, how does it target, how does it get into target cells, the benefits and the drawbacks. Okay, so have this sheet in front of you as we move on and we go into a bit more depth. Here we are. So vectors are things that get the genes into the cells where we need them. So let's look at two different vectors. First of all, liposomes. Now liposomes are tiny little spheres of lipid. Okay, just like um, they're, they're made of basically biological membranes. They're made of phospholipid, a phospholipid bilayer around the outside. And in the middle, they have a, a plasmid or, or a piece of DNA that we want to introduce into this target cell. So let's see how that works. When we uh, push sort of put the liposomes near the cell, they are unable to, let's show that again, fuse with the membrane because they're both phospholipid. So we have that fusion event just there um, where the membrane of the liposome fuses with the membrane of the cell, introducing the, uh, introducing the DNA into the cell. Okay. So it's worth saying that this is not the most efficient way. So that's one of the drawbacks because um, they're not, it's not really targeted to any great deal uh, of specificity. Um, we're just kind of hoping that the membranes merge and we get DNA into a cell. So it's not extremely efficient, but um, it is less likely to cause an immune response. What about a viral vector? Well, viruses are, are great for getting DNA or RNA into cells. That's what they do. The coronavirus, for example, which is happening right now, um, is, is not an adenovirus, but it is a respiratory virus, and it is very able to uh, put its DNA into our cells, um, and it has evolved some ways, some sort of clever ways of doing that. So we can take advantage of that, this by using um, a viral vector. So we edit the virus, so we replace its genetic material with the genetic material that we want. We might leave some viral genes in there, because they might enable the virus to kind of get into the cell and they might, the virus might need them. So as the virus targets the cell, it would normally bind to specific kind of lock and key type receptors and then it would get its DNA right into the nucleus of the cell. And if we use something like a retrovirus, um, then the retrovirus is very well adapted and it can actually integrate the DNA into the host genome using a protein called an integrase. So that's the retrovirus. Now, this is more efficient. If we're talking about advantages. It's much more likely to, to get the DNA into the cell. We can target it more accurately using specific protein sort of lock and key type interactions. However, it can create an immune response in the patient. The patient might think that they are being invaded by a sort of pathogenic virus, uh, or, and the immune system might react to that, which could cause um, side effects. Okay. So what I'd like you to do now is just to make sure that you fill this out. Now use your textbook page to fill this all out, um, the benefits and the drawbacks, okay? And once you've done that, we can move on and look at a slightly newer technology, okay? So pause this, fill this table out, and then we'll move on in a sec. 
Right, now remember last lesson, I just wanted to highlight this. We talked about um, potential for modifying viruses. Okay, so this is just another picture of using an adenovirus vector to transfer a new gene into the cell. Uh, and I also mentioned this unfortunate, very unfortunate young man who died uh, now over 20 years ago uh, in an early gene therapy trial. Okay. Now, I also wanted to update you on how gene editing can be used, because actually the stuff in the syllabus uh, in the textbook is a bit out of date now. The textbook was written really before this kind of CRISPR-Cas9 revolution took off. So CRISPR-Cas9 is a much more precise way of getting genes uh, into cells. And the reason is, instead of just cutting with a restriction enzyme, um, which... which um, and the reason is, instead of cutting with a restriction enzyme, where there's only a few sites that we can use, CRISPR-Cas9 can be targeted and actually um, directed to cut at any site that we like. So we can make sure that it cuts exactly either side of a defective cystic fibrosis allele and introduces the DNA that we would like. So have a look at this video for three minutes to kind of update yourself about what is actually going on. And this is actually three years old. Um, in more modern um, iterations of gene therapy. Pause this, watch that, and come back to me. Okay, so now this is a bit of a uh, difficult one to adapt for virtual school. Um, but what I would have got you to do if we were in class is I would have divided you up into groups and got you to read one of these articles, summarise it, and then present it to another group to kind of explain what you read. So really I think what you should do here um, is maybe to read certainly one, maybe two, maybe even three of these articles. You don't have to read them all. So read one or two of these articles, uh, follow the hyperlinks uh, attached to the PowerPoint that goes out with this, um, and see if you can kind of just get a vague, you know, a general idea about the science behind the article. What happened in the trial? Was it a success? Uh, was it a failure? And is there a future for this technology? Okay, read one of these, one or two of these articles, um, and then we'll move on. Pause the video, off you go. Right, okay, so now we're coming on to the summary questions. Um, you know the drill at this point. Have a look at um, these five questions, answer them in your books as best you can, pause the video, and then in a few seconds, I'm gonna put up the mark scheme, and I wanna see your green penned um, questions from here, and also your notes uh, from that, two different types of vector questions. So pause the video. And now we're coming back with the answers. So here we go. Here are the answers. Um, some of them are a little bit lengthy, so have a look through there. Uh, making sure that you're using key vocabulary like allele and functioning, zygote, embryo, all that sort of thing. Um, and then green pen your answers. Okay, so we're going to move on to the syllabus check. Don't go yet. So the syllabus check is really just these points here. Uh, but then I also want to just congratulate you because you have finished the A level. Uh, Biology syllabus. So you did it. Um, it's been um, a bit weird finishing the syllabus like this, but um, I hope you found these videos useful. Uh, so really, really proud of you for, for sticking with it. Uh, and you've done really, really well with, with these kind of virtual lessons. Thank you to everyone who's been getting in their work. It's been really, really wonderful. Um, I am setting you some sort of Easter holidays work, um, which is this Easter doddle task. I did warn you about this in class. Uh, now, I've had a look at it and I've actually adapted it slightly. So what I'm getting you to do is I want you to do this. Get all the year 13 double tasks done to above 90%, okay? I counted them. I think there's something like 16, okay? So you could do like one a day or two a day and that would get you done, okay? But maybe you do three a day, then have a day off and then do another three or something like that. So I want you to get all the year 13 double tasks done. That is compulsory and that is by kind of the start of virtual school again, which is on April the 20th. The year 12 double tasks... I'm going to set, but they're up to you if you'd like to do them. So if you find it useful for revision, you can work through all the year 12 doddle tasks as well. Up to you, but that is an optional task. The year 13 doddle task is not optional. Okay, That's going to prepare you for um, what we're going to do in after Easter, which is going to be some uh, practice papers uh, to prepare you for um, what's coming next. Okay, We're still sort of unsure 100% about what's going to happen, but we do know that some of you might be able to sit these exams in September um, or even next year if you're not happy with the predicted grades. And we really don't know the method behind how the predicted grades are going to be calculated. I mean, we put our predicted grades 
to the exam board, and then we basically don't really know how the exam board corrects those, but they will be doing something with them, like moving them up or down, depending on sort of previous data. So if you're not happy with the grades, then I wanna keep preparing you to get even better grades uh, by doing this stuff. Anyway, so massive thanks from me uh, for sticking with it and have a great Easter holidays. Um, tick, chip away at these doddle tasks and I'll check back in with you after then. Thanks very much, bye-bye.